Sir? So we'll get started. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to have you here, and more importantly, for New India Foundation, it's a it's a pleasure to have Dinar here um, on behalf of the trustees at New India Foundation, Neerja, myself, Srinath um, Raghavan, who couldn't make it. Um, we, we welcome all of you here. New India Foundation is looking at and thinking a lot about post-1947 um, India in our core offering, which is our book fellowship program, where we have 25 books published. We also have an annual lecture in Bangalore. We have just announced a new translation fellowship um, for 10 languages. We have requested applications for people to take a book in one of the 10 Indian languages that we have identified and translated into English. We will know the response at the end of December, and hopefully we will award the fellowships um, starting next year. Um, the idea being that a lot of post-1947 India is captured in those languages and um, not accessible um, to many of us, at least. So the New India Foundation Book Prize, named after Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, is, uh, is not as old as the fellowship. It's, it's in our fourth year. And we are delighted that um, uh, Dinyar's um, book came at a time when all of us, everybody was telling us that COVID is you know, really hard for the publishing industry and there are not enough books coming out. But we had a really tough time, the 12 books in the long list, the six books in the short list. Um, Nija did a wonderful job in helping the jury, putting um, it all together. And there was just such unanimity in the jury at the end about um, Dinyar's book that we had no choice in the end. It was just a spectacular work of scholarship, obviously. Um, at your age, you know, people say writing biographies is something you get to um, in your old age, but clearly you have hit the ground running. So what I'm going to ask, and before we kick it off, the way we propose it is um, 20 minutes, Dinyar will tell us about um, his book in Naroji, 20 minutes, me and Nirja will chat with him, and then we would have, have love to have you ask um, him some questions after that. But before we kick off, I just want to ask um, Ram. Um, Ram and Nandan are the original Kama Dehinus of um, New India Foundation. <laughs> and um, they're gifts which keep giving. And we'd like Ram to hand over the trophy and the check to the Nyan. Thank you, Ram. Thank you, Ram. <laughs> so now we'll ask Dinyar to talk about his book. Would you like to do it from there, which is perfect, or you come here, whatever works for you. Your book might so on. Um, so, is it on now? Yes, good. Good. Okay. So, um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank all of the judges uh, from the, the New India Foundation and all the trustees, uh, everyone affiliated with, with the New India Foundation for, first of all, evaluating all of these books. I, as I mentioned to you in a, a message I'd sent out to all of you, I, I don't know how you're able to go through 150 books every year. I, Look forward to finding out, considering that I've, I, I myself are unable to read more than, say, that amount in the span of several years. But um, I really am, I feel very honored for uh, this selection, especially given that, um, you know, both the long list and the, sh and the short list contain some really excellent scholarship. So I would really, first of all, like to thank all of you for uh, your selection and your, in, in, you know, your endorsement and your support, not just for myself, but for, you know, the work that is being done at large. Uh, on study of, of modern India. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about my book and the process and such. The, the book grew out of a dissertation. I had, I had done a, a dissertation at, at Harvard University, started it in 2007. I had no intention going into the, the PhD to become an academic. Um, I just wanted to study something that I was interested in, which was primarily Parsi history. I'm a Parsi myself, so kind of wanted to study more about the culture, then get back out and do a real job, so to speak. And Needless to say, that didn't happen. Uh, you know, uh, things worked out a little bit differently. But um, in 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 the course of my time as a, uh, a PhD candidate, um, 
I found it unusual that there was so little work done on uh, people in the early nationalist generation. I mean, you know, there, there, there was a, a wave of scholarship in the, in the 60s and 70s, and after that it kind of petered out. And even that scholarship in the, that was done in the 60s and 70s was oftentimes a little bit dismissive of this generation. People were regarded as, you know, the, the early nationalists were regarded as people who kind of just worked for their own benefit. You know, they, they were camp, championed civil service reform so they could get jobs, and that was about it. And, you know, nothing really happened until Gandhi came on the scene. Um, and, you know, I thought that was a little bit unfair of a, of a, a judgment to be made. Um, and it was around the time I, I first met Ram, I think, at, in Harvard, and he had encouraged me to you know, think about working on a project uh, on someone like Nauruji. And uh, I came to the National Archives in India, I think, in 2011, so about 10 years ago. Um, and up until that point, I had no clue what exactly was there in terms of Nauruji's collection. People had told me that all the papers had gone. Some people said it's all there. You know, it was there was no one definitive um, answer about what exactly was there. And when I went there, I discovered that, you know, there were about 30,000 documents uh, in this collection. Um, many papers were not uh, properly indexed. Uh, and so I started to go, you know, methodically through them. I only got through about half of the papers. Uh, so, you know, I've only seen about 50% of the material there, but it, it was a, a really rich collection of material. And a lot of that material had not been looked at by many scholars. I mean, the one scholar who'd really uh, examined uh, this collection before me was S.R. Mirotra, who some of you may have known. He was a major historian of the Congress movement who passed away about two years ago. Uh, and so people like him and Ram and, and others were really encouraging uh, for me to, you know, kind of re-examine this life and, and see what contributions this individual made. And, and the results of that research yielded, um, you know, a story of someone Naroji, who, uh, you know, lived in multiple worlds simultaneously. I mean, Naroji was born in Bombay, in colonial Bombay. His parents left uh, Gujarat, probably because of famine conditions. So, you know, they weren't very rich. Um, but he was someone who grew up in, in colonial Bombay with access to public education, uh, with access to English language education. And, you know, he rose within the span of uh, two decades uh, to be, you know, at the pinnacle of Bombay society. He was someone who was conversing with British judges, the, the governors, uh, the elite Shetia class, who are the, you know, the, the Parsi, Hindu, Muslim um, commercial elites of the city. Uh, so, you know, on top of that, at the age of 30, he uh, went for the first time to Great Britain. Uh, he did that in the year 1855. And at that time, anyone going abroad, it was a big deal. Uh, so as I mentioned in my book, you know, the first time he went abroad, he actually created a traffic jam. Uh, people wanting to see him off, uh, you know, at at the dock in order to go to Great Britain, um, and you know the world that Naroji lived in expanded tremendously once he had gone to Great Britain because he was immersed in, um, you know, the commercial culture of Great Britain. He worked as a cotton merchant uh, and increasingly in the political culture as well of the of the late Victorian era. So he got to know. Uh, you know, people like, uh, you know, Henry Main or, or people working at University College London, where he was a professor. Uh, and eventually he uh, began inhabiting different universes there in the political world as well, like the socialist universe. And, and people like Henry Hinman and uh, the Webbs, uh, for example. Uh, so by the time Nauruji was at his political prime, the 1880s, 1890s or so, uh, he was an Indian nationalist. He was a British liberal. He was also, to a certain degree, a, a, a European socialist. Uh, he was an, an economic scholar, uh, someone who, of course, had propounded the drain theory and talked about why India was so poor. Uh, he was someone who some people regarded as being uh, almost seditious. Uh, you know, he was never obviously tried with sedition, but many people thought that he was, you know, coming dangerously close. Uh, by the end of his political careers, many Indian nationalists thought that he was not radical enough. I mean, he was kind of, you know, he was since he was in Great Britain for so so long, he kind of missed that tide that propelled people like uh, Pipan Chandrapal and Tilak and others uh, into, into the fore. Uh, so he represented many things to, to many different people. And you know, he was a journalist. Um, he also dabbled in you know, all sorts of activities. I mean, you, the, the mere fact that Naroji kept all of his correspondence made it easy for me to reconstruct all aspects of his life. So you know, he was very interested in cricket uh, at a very late age. You know, in the 70s, people are talking to him about cricket, and God knows if he was still active playing. Uh, he was uh, someone who enjoyed singing. So there was a, a Gujarati singing uh, a song, uh, a Gujarati music organization called the Gyan Utejik Mandali, uh, which was around, and he was a, a very active member. Uh, you know, he was involved in a lot of commercial activities with people uh, who were trading, uh, you know, between India and London, but he was also someone who mentored a great deal of uh, students who came from India to Great Britain in order to study, uh, learn things like glass making or, you know, 
go there to launch inventive careers as well. Uh, so you really wore many hats. Um, and one thing I tried to do in the book is kind of bring this multidimensional aspect uh, you know, to the man. I mean, biographies are stories of lives, but ultimately they also need to reflect the multiple lives that these people inhabited and also the lives of those people who they were in touch with. Um, and I think one of the really rewarding things of this project was learning about all the other people that were involved in Naroji's life, ranging from, uh, you know, people we've you know, we, who we do not know about today. I mean, people, um, you know, who came from India to study in, in Great Britain, uh, one or two who got in trouble with the law, one person who got, you know, uh, arrested for public drunkenness, and Naroji was this person's uh, contact to get bailed out of jail. So, you know, that gives you a flavor of the community activities he did, uh, all the way up to people like, you know, Gladstone. Uh, or um, Henry Campbell Bannerman, the Prime Ministers of Great Britain, which, you know, he, he knew to a certain degree, didn't know them very well, uh, but, you know, he communicated with them. Uh, he communicated with leading socialists like Henry Hinman, uh, the Webbs, again, uh, you know, uh, Sydney and Beatrice Webb. Uh, so, you know, examining one, a person like Nauroji gives us an opportunity not just to look at an Indian nationalist, but someone who participated in uh, British politics and also international uh, anti-colonialism, because by the end of his life, his ideas were circulating well beyond the British Empire. Uh, they were circulating in the United States, where progressive polit uh, politicians had uh, adopted his ideas of the drain theory in order to argue that Americans should not, um, you know, expand and keep control of, of territory in places like the Philippines or Cuba or, or, or Puerto Rico, which had recently been annexed in the Spanish-American War. Uh, the ideas that he propounded were circulating to West uh, West Indian nationalists and, uh, you know, African leaders in, in the United States, uh, perhaps a few also coming from Africa, you know, who were, who were living in London at the time. Uh, so it really was a, a very global, uh, you know, life in many ways that he led. Uh, so with that, you know, I, I'd like to keep my remarks at least relatively short. I'd be much more interested to talk to you about questions. Uh, you know, first, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll have a bit of a conversation and then uh, I'm happy to talk to you know, all of you about the particular questions that you may have. Sorry. Is that better? Yes. Thanks, thanks. That was fantastic. Um, you know, we're in Bangalore, and obviously he he weaponized Brit British's data set, right? There was an annual report called the Morality and Material Progress yes. Report, and he used that data to prove that, and he said these results are not only worthless but mischievous. So can you just explain the drain theory a little bit, and was it economics, was it statistics, or was it Politicals, or was it just a polem Was it just an agenda? It was all of that, quite frankly. I mean, at at, at the you know the ultimate um, you know the ultimate result, the, the the ultimate motivation for Nauruji in in pursuing this idea of there being a drain of wealth was to argue for self government. I mean, that you know by the 1880s it was very clear that he was using economic scholarship to buttress a political argument. Um, but you know he originally started out uh, with his interest in the drain because of. The, the experience of famines that India experienced in, in the 19th century. And you know, the famines that India experienced from roughly the 1850s all the way up until the 1910s were, were terrible. And, you know, they, they occurred right here, of course. You know, I mean, Mysore state was uh, one of the better off states in terms of princely states to be affected by famine, but still there were you know, people who were affected here. In the 1870s, there was a big famine in the Madras presidency, which affected this area as well. Um, so, you know, they were grounded in scholarship. You know, in, in our current era, of course, you know, where truth is, of course, uh, you know, something that can be easily dispensed with. It's, it's difficult to really understand what Naroji was able to do. Um, but, you know, he took, you know, what was meant to be authoritative, you know, this, this document, this, uh, this canon of British uh, statistics and, and uh, you know, writings and arguments on how it was a, a force for improving lives in India, uh, and basically looked at the fine print and said, no, it's absolutely wrong. Right? So, I mean, he'd look at, say, how the British calculated uh, average crop yields, and he'd show that, you know, there were statistic, you know, several statistical flaws in that. So he went to a great deal of detail. Uh, at the same time, you know, he would correspond with people he knew on the ground, farmers, uh, friends that he knew who were operating mills, uh, who would be able to contradict uh, the, the numbers and the data that the British were giving. Uh, so that was, you know, the statistical uh, aspect of his work. But all of this, ultimately, by the 1870s and 1880s, when he, you know, he's emerging as a major political figure, were directed uh, with a specific political goal. And that political goal was originally some measure of political reform for India and eventually Swaraj. Should I? Right. Um, so then your wonderful book. I was very struck by your account of Naroji's commitment to girls' education. Hmm. The fact that 
you know, he was not yet 25 or just about 25 when he had partnered with a bunch of people to set up as many as six girls schools in Bombay. Correct. And he was teaching at Elphinstone College and teaching voluntarily in these schools as well. And then he goes on, as you recount later in the book, um, to not just uh, you know, be in touch with British suffragists uh, and so on, but also to be vice president of two major associations, the International uh, Women's Union, as well as this Progressive Society of Women or some such. Right. Uh, yeah? right. And so it, you know, I wondered whether he had any reflections, which I don't find in the book, but if you come across them, any reflections on the question of female franchise in the Indian context, uh, mm -hmm. of course, we know that you know the year he died is the year that the All India Women's Conference was set up, 1917. That's the year that Sarojini Naidu leads a delegation right. asking for the franchise for women right. and so on. But what were his views, if any, on the issue of women's political rights? And also, added to that, uh, I was curious to know whether in his personal relationships with women, for instance, in the family, mm -hmm. Was he, uh, you know, was he a conventional patriarch or was he a progressive parent of two daughters? What was he like in that department as well? So to your first question, I wish I knew more about what his attitudes were towards suffrage here in India. Um, you know, oftentimes Nairobi was the type of person who articulated a lot of views about what the, the you know, the rights of workers or the, the rights of women were in Great Britain. Uh, but his ideas and, and his, uh, you know, his particular perspectives on what they were in India, it's a bit more difficult uh, to figure out exactly what his, what his views were. I mean, you know, there are hints here and there. I mean, he talked about as early as the 1880s about how both women and men should uh, occupy equal, equal spheres in, in, you know, in the world, you know, publicly and privately in the home. Um, but there's no one explicit passage I can point you to that says that he supported uh, female suffrage. Um, clearly his, you know, his granddaughters did, you know, they were involved in that generation who were campaigning for female suffrage here in, in India. Um, and, you know, Naroji knew Sarojini Naidu when, he, when she was a student and, you know, early in her political career, I'm sure that they must have discussed issues like this uh, in person, but unfortunately those conversations are lost to us. Um, in, in terms of what he was like as, uh, as a parent and a grandparent, um, there was a bit of this mix of, you know, the traditional Indian patriarch and, and someone who was unnaturally progressive uh, for someone in his era. So, um, you know, on the side of the, the you know, the, the patriarch, um, if you look at Naroji's relations with his wife, again, it's a blank slate. You know, I mean, Vinit Thakur has written a book recently about uh, Sastri, uh, Srinivasa Sastri, and he says in the book, you know, there's hardly anything that, you know, one can tell about Sastri's wife uh, from his archival material. And this is exactly the same with Naroji. I mean, his wife's name comes up once or twice in correspondence. Uh, his wife was probably illiterate. Um, supposedly, he had tried to teach her. She wasn't interested, but God knows. I mean, this is hearsay. Um, so there's no real record that emerges of her, uh, which is shocking for someone who, uh, you know, was so progressive, at least on the record, about the rights of women and the need for women's education. Uh, we know that for his daughters, and as you said, he had two daughters, uh, and for his granddaughters especially, he was very, very uh, supportive of their, of their ability to get, uh, you know, uh, education at the highest levels. Um, you know, one of his daughters went and... Uh, you know, attempted to do medical work in, in Great Britain. Um, then in his grandchildren's generation, one daughter went to the Sorbonne, one went to Oxford, uh, you know, one uh, trained as a, as, a, as a doctor. So these are, these are the female uh, uh, grandchildren. Uh, and they all went on to do pretty incredible things with their lives. I mean, you, some of you may have heard of the Captain Sisters, Kushit Ben, um, Nargish, and, and Perin. And these were three individuals who were involved in um, a great degree of Gandhian activities uh, from the 30s through the 40s. Um, and, you know, they took up a lot of this progressive spirit that Naroji had inculcated in them as children and, you know, brought it all the way up into the 50s and 60s. So can you cover his elections a little bit? He stood three times, right? Yes. And it seemed like he said what he needed to do to get elected, right? <laughs> or he seemed like he... He seemed like, you know, what a politician should do. You, you say what you need to get elected, even though you don't believe it. Or was that true? And maybe, maybe not. And just that there was this Macharji Bhavarangir. Bhaur Macharji Bhavarangir. Yeah. So he was a MP just a little after him for 10 years. Nobody yeah. really cares for him. Nobody really remembers him. So was he this lackey or loser? Or, or why, why isn't he important? So there is a scholar, actually, um, who is working on a biography on Bhavarangir. I, that's one person I should mention to you also, who, who might, who might uh, you know, be publishing something sometime soon. Uh, and his argument is that Bhavnagri is actually some, someone who, you know, is not 
as easily caricatured as being, you know, a, you know, a puppet of the British. Uh, he definitely did do a lot, for example, to support Gandhi's activities in South Africa. And he also did a lot to uh, work on issues of industrial promotion in India. But at the same time, yes, uh, he was quite pro-British. Uh, and, you know, someone had recently pointed out to me also, you know, he had, uh, you know, supported individuals who had, you know, proposed anti-Semitic legislation in the United Kingdom also. So there was a definite dark side to him as, as well, from our perspective, right? Uh, but Bhavnagri, again, is a good example of, of how someone, you know, we, we, we pigeonhole him in, in a certain category, right? Uh, but the actual individual is much more complex. Uh, Bhav, so Bhavnagri was a conservative member of parliament from 1895 to 1906. Uh, and was regarded in many ways as the anti naruji an Indian who was a conservative and who was against the Congress. But he also, he, you know, a few years before he was uh, elected to the uh, to, to Parliament, uh, he was by all means supposedly a bit more liberal. I mean, he actually campaigned for Nauruji's, uh election to Parliament. Uh, his colors changed. Uh, you know, a lot of the the, the friends that uh, Nauruji and uh, Bhavnagri had in common were conservatives. So, I mean he kind of straddled various aspects of the political divide. I mean, in this era, in the Victorian era, the, the political landscape was very different from, you know, say what the UK uh, political landscape is right now. And you can go, you could go across back and forth quite easily. Uh, and someone like Bob Nauruji did. Now, Roji did to a certain degree in the sense that he had uh, several friends who were conservatives who actually helped him and actually tried to uh, encourage him to think about running uh, for parliament as a conservative. Now, Roji ultimately turned that down. And again, he went quite to the other extreme by becoming pretty much a socialist by the end of his life. Um, but you could cross the aisle uh, with greater ease then than you can now. So how did he win the election? So, you know, what, what you said about, you know, did he need to say certain things to get elected? Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, if you read the, the, the public pronouncements that Nauruji said on the campaign trail, uh, so Nauruji first stood for election from Holborn, which is the area around the British Museum, uh, and eventually Central Finsbury, which is, you know, if you go a bit north from the British Museum, kind of to the east of St. Pancras Station, uh, that particular area over there, that's the region he, he campaigned for. Uh, and in both areas, you know, he was quite... You could say patriotic of the British Empire. He said, you know, the, you know, the British Empire is a force for freedom. British people have a sense of justice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And to a large degree, he did believe these ideas for the good duration of his life. I mean, by the end of his life, he was coming to doubt uh, this idea of British justice. Uh, many people like Tilak were saying, you know, what are you talking about? How can you say this? Uh, quite legitimately, I think, in in in, in my opinion. Um, but you know, there was a degree of him saying things you know, for the sake of getting elected. I mean, just as, you know, in India or the United States, you must play up a certain patriotic angle. Uh, now, Roji definitely did this. Um, you know, he described himself as a British citizen, uh, you know, with an asterisk, of course, a British Indian citizen. But he also did some very subversive things. Uh, so, you know, perhaps the most subversive things he did while a candidate uh, was talk about um, the plight of, of, of Irish people. I mean, Ireland was, of course, a semi-colony. Uh, at that stage. I mean, it was, a, it was a, a country where, you know, the majority of people were quite disenfranchised, Catholics, uh, where there was a great deal of discrimination, uh, racial and, and cultural and, and based on religion. Uh, and Naroji was quite brutal in his assessment of how British people treated uh, uh, Irishmen and Irish women. I mean, to the point where you'd say, you know, you know, you British, you know, you, uh, sorry, you, you, you British people, you, you know, you, you pillory the Irish for being, you know, barbarians, but at the same time, you treat them as barbarians, you know, what, you know, how, you know, how dare you treat your fellow citizens in, the, in this way. Um, and this was a good plank for Naruch to build up kind of cross imperial, if you will, uh, solidarities between Ireland and India. Uh, so a lot of the ways he was, you know, he, he campaigned in central Finsbury for one important reason. There was a great, there was a, a large population of Irishmen. Uh, living there. Of course, Irish women could not vote, but Irish men, many of them could. Uh, and so, you know, he, you know, would go to the Irishmen in his constituency and say, look, you know, we Indians, we have a lot in common with you in the sense that we demand much more justice from the British, uh, you know, administration. Uh, we also have faced impoverishment, famine. Uh, so, you know, the amount of rapport that uh, existed between Irishmen and Indians at the time was, was quite off the charts. I mean, there were some letters which uh, you know, I didn't eventually incorporate into the book, but which I might incorporate into like future volumes of Naroji's writings. Uh, you know, where, where Irishmen are basically saying, "You, you, you, and and us," you know, meaning Indians and Irishmen, we have a lot in common, and you know, we need to work together in order to, uh, you know, get our mutual rights. And this is precisely what future generations did. I mean, people like Nehru were friendly with you know people like Valera, uh, and you know, before them, you know, um, others, you know, Krishna Menon, I think also. Uh, had a, a degree of, uh, you know, close relationship with several Irish individuals. Uh, so, you know, this is one aspect of India's national struggle, which 
uh, tends to get left out in a lot of the textbooks, how Indians built up these alliances with, with other co colonized people. Right, so I was curious about um, the other side, as it were. Hmm. How did the colonial state perceive Naruji? Hmm. Did their perception of him, did, did the state's perception of him change, uh, you know, or, or, or uh, shift over time depending on the increase in his usance value, if you like. Absolutely, yeah. So at the outset, say in the 1860s and 1870s, um, there were many people who you know, were quite sympathetic in the British establishment to what he was saying. Um, and you know, some scholars have pointed out that you know, in the 1860s, there was this moment. Uh, Linda Colley has most recently done this in the book that she's written recently. There, there was a moment when it, one you know, could have thought that there was a spirit of liberalization in, in you know, animating a lot of uh, imperial politics. And Naroti was swept up in that way. So, I mean, a lot of the colonial officials that he was talking to were saying, you know, you're absolutely right. Let's do some reform. By the 1870s and 1870s, the door slams shut on this. And you get a bit more of a conservative reaction, which definitely heightens by the 1890s. So in the 1895 election in Great Britain, a conservative government comes into power. And there you see a dramatic change. Uh, so, you know, the... the the officials who are in power, uh, you know, under Lord Salisbury, the, the prime minister in Great Britain, uh, are livid with Nauroji. And, you know, in, you see it in the letters and in the correspondence. The correspondence that say Salisbury has with someone like Lord Curzon or, uh, you know, the Secretary of State for India. Um, they are absolutely livid about his campaigns. And, you know, they, they call Nauroji an agitator and, you know, someone who is, you know, uh, borderline seditious. Uh, it does not get to the point where people are trailing Naroji. I mean, that obviously was the case for, you know, uh, some of his contemporaries, people like Sabarkar or, uh, or, or others. Uh, but, you know, I do know that several of the meetings that Naroji attended were uh, places where, you know, there would be, a, you know, technically a spy in the audience operating, you know, for the colonial office or the India office. Uh, but it never got to the, the point, I think, where, you know, there was a file on Naroji. Um, you know, there, there certainly were files on his granddaughters, uh, which I've seen. Uh, but for Naruji, I think, you know, he was too ingrained in the political establishment for that to really happen. And of course, um, you know, if you were an outspoken Indian, uh, it was to your benefit to go to London. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a, an academic who's written an, an, an essay on this, calling London the, the soft underbelly, to use Churchill's phrase, of, of, of the empire, in the sense that, you know, if you wanted to say something terrible about uh, British imperialists, you went to London and you could say that with perfect freedom. I mean, something that would get you arrested in, in India, uh, in London, it was just, you know, you're just one of several people in Hyde Park Corner saying, you know, things about the government. Uh, so Naroji could take advantage of that. Uh, he could speak um, further and more boldly than I think many of his colleagues could. You know, I mean, Gokhale brought up pretty much that fact. I mean, in, in, the, 1850, in, the, in the 1890s, you know, he's, he wrote to Naroji saying, you know, the, the Indian government here is acting like a a Russian government. And what that meant at the time was, you know, the czars were thought to be the most authoritarian of all people in terms of the ruling class in the world. And so, you know, Gokhale could say, you in comparison have a, a great, greater deal of freedom because you're sitting in London, we here in India really have to watch our backs now. So can you, why did the, the three phases, at least that I got from your book, were the activist phase, the parliamentarian phase, mm -hmm. and the radical phase? So he changed his mind quite substantially over his life. Of course. So yeah. What were those intersections in which he changed his mind? Because the first one was, you know, a little, it wasn't, it didn't seem nationalist, it seemed a little loyalist. So what were those intersections which happened? Sure. And I'll, I'll explain for those of you who haven't uh, seen the book. So in, in my book, I, I outlined three distinct phases. The first phase of his life is where he, uh, talks about the drain of wealth. So roughly from the time he is in his 30s uh, until maybe he is in his 50s. So roughly, you know, from the 1850s until around the 1870s or so. Uh, and this is a period where for about 20 or 25 years, he engages in, in some pretty detailed scholarship on the drain of wealth. So again, going through statistics, putting charts and tables together, which show that British imperialism is causing famines. A second phase is where he, uh, you know, shifts, he, he stops this, this active scholarship for the, for the large part uh, and shifts to, uh, you know, campaigning for uh, the British Parliament, uh, you know, kind of taking the ideas that he's developed about the drain of wealth and putting them into political action. Um, and this culminates in his election to Parliament in 1892 uh, through 1895, but then he loses. Uh, and, you know, his loss is in many ways the worst, you know, the worst moment in his life. I mean, his whole ambition of his life has, you know, shattered to pieces. 
Uh, and so at this point, you know, Naruji is about 70 years old. He could retire. He could, you know, go back to India. Uh, and he has nothing doing. And he goes off in an even more radical di uh, direction, which is what I call the third phase of his life, where he, you know, he radicalizes to a substantial degree. He doesn't become a Tilak, not at all. But at the same time, he is, um, you know, basically... Um, you know, going around Great Britain with people like Henry Hinman, who are far more radical in, in his demeanor and basically are actually encouraging open rebellion for Indians. Uh, so he's keeping dangerous company, so to speak. Um, but, uh, you know, he's, he's talking about how uh, now the time has come for Swaraj to be given to India uh, because, you know, the drain of wealth is just causing so much impoverishment and, and uh, you know, terrible famines that, you know, this is what India really needs to achieve at this point. So, to the part of your question about whether, you know, what, what his statements are like about, you know, whether he was a nationalist or not, um, Narochi is a great example of someone whose, you know, views radicalized quite steadily with time. Uh, you know, he was someone who, uh, you know, in his 60s and 70s was growing more radical. Uh, you know, most of us, when you reach that age, you know, you tend to get set in your views. Um, Narochi was going further to the left as, you know, as he aged until about when he was around 81 years of, of, of age, which is when his political career ended. So at his, you know, his the youngest phases of his political career, when he's in Bombay and as well as when he's in London, there are times when he can seem quite patriotic about the British Empire. I mean, he says, you know, the British Empire is a force for good. He actually even says in one or two papers, some of the drain is legitimate. We Indians need to pay the Britons for the services they are rendering uh, towards India, uh, you know, building the railways, running the administration, all these things. Um, by the end of the life, by the end of his life, he's he's thrown out all these ideas. I mean, he's called British rule evil. Uh, he's talked about the, the bleeding of India. Uh, so you know, there are certain references here and there to certain positive sentiments towards you know Britons or British rule in general. But by and large, it's been thrown out. Uh, so you know, which is in many ways, I mean, this follows the tenor of Indian nationalism. I mean, you know, if you read the proceedings of the first Indian National Congress, you'll, you know, kind of wake up and say, what, what is going on here? You know, are they fighting for <laughs> independence? Or I mean, what are they doing? I mean, they're not fighting for independence at this stage, right? They're not. I mean, they're fighting for political rights. In private, yes, they could say, well, you know, our ultimate aim is to get something like self-government, but on paper, absolutely no, you would not say that. Because if you did say that in person, you know, you would be shut down. Um, and the Congress was nearly shut down on several instances, you know, through, you know, the time of Lord Curzon's administration. So you had to be careful in your public pronouncements. And the best way to be careful was to say at the very beginning, you know, if, if we were sitting in a Congress meeting in 1885, we'd begin by saying, you know, the British Empire is great. We, you know, God, God, you know, God praise the Queen, all that stuff. Um, and then we'd get into, you know, why British rule was bad. Yeah. So I actually want to follow up on uh, the question that Manish just asked, which you answered uh, uh, in a sense, like you just said, it's the tensions within Indian nationalism in India, hmm. uh, you know, we, from reform versus what later became Purna Swaraj that are really manifested in, in a sense, uh, Naroji's own person or personality encapsulates those dilemmas that's there within him in a certain sense, those diverse, those conflicting trends, Absolutely. if you like, which are which are seen in India. But, uh, you know, there's a hint in your book, um, and I could be wrong, but I that's the way I interpreted it. This is sort of revisionist uh, uh, view, that the loyalism in his uh, speech, in, in fact, you mentioned the election campaign as well a while mm -hmm. ago, that the loyalism was tactical. Mm -hmm. And and that the path he and the, and the method he chose to express that was in a sense holding up the mirror to the British, hence poverty and un-British rule in India. You know, right. this is the hypocrisy of the principles you preach, and this is what you actually practice. Right. right, right. And then he moves on from there later too. So I was wondering whether this really was uh, was the earlier phase. Uh, you know, whatever he said in the earlier phase is holding up the mirror. Did he at some point realize that this wasn't working? That persuasion wasn't Hmm. Uh, the way to achieve any of these goals uh, or really was it, you know, so, so was it really tactical or was it that he genuinely realized partly because of what was going on in the Indian national movement in, in that phase hmm. here, but partly also because of, like your book shows admirably, the expanding global horizons. He's, uh, he's dealing with, you know, race in the United States for the first time. He's engaging with Indians in South Africa. Mm. He's doing so. So there's a there's a global context as well. Plus, of course, Heinemann, Marx, and all the others. But but there is this larger context in, within which presumably he realizes that there are limitations to persuasion. So right. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think toward, towards the end of his life, again, those those last ten years, the the so-called third phase of his life, that's where you know he's really kind of facing kind of this exis existential crisis. You know. 
the tactics that I have used throughout my life, you know, you know, exposing, you know, you know, the, the British to what they're actually doing, you know, holding up the mirror, do not seem to be working. Um, and, you know, the last political speech that he gives at the Calcutta Congress, he says, you know, actually, you know, I've, you know, I faced so many disappointments in my life that I've been tempted to rebel. Uh, so, you know, he hinted at least, I mean, internally, there must be a, have been a terrible struggle between his ideals uh, and, you know, his ultimate faith in being able to achieve what he wanted to do uh, using constitutional tactics and a realization by the early 20th century that that was not going anywhere. Um, he did not break through. Ultimately, and 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 you know this 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 was something which again the generation of Pal and Tilak and all criticized Naroji for, and I, I think to a degree uh, legitimately criticized him. I mean, they, Tilak pointed out, look, if you were in India under Curzon's rule, you would come to the same conclusion that that you know I have that you know you must do something else other than constitutional tactics. And Tilak wrote a, a, a long letter to Naroji saying, I'm not talking about violence, but I'm talking about things like boycott, national you know national education, uh, organization of the masses. And, you know, unfortunately, we don't have, or at least I haven't found Nauruji's reply to that, but um, one can get a sense from his last speech. I mean, if you look at that Congress speech that he gives in 1906, there's a very definite tension between two ideals. I mean, an acceptance that many of the radicals were right, that something more needed to be done. Swadeshi was correct. Uh, what was happening in Bengal after the part partition was, uh, you know, a good thing. It was something to be celebrated. Nauruji says, you know, I, I, I don't think he said it in that particular speech. He said it one or two years beforehand, no, maybe one year before, in 1905, you know, he said he was very happy to see that the birth of Indian patriotism had finally taken place with the partition because of all the political protests that have happened. Yet, in that speech, there were still references to British justice, working on behalf of, you know, constitutional tactics, a certain faith in the British elector, the need to elect MPs to the British Parliament. So here's a man who's clearly conflicted. Um, and, you know, people like Tilak, did see that conflict. I mean, Tilak gave a speech in College uh, Square a few days after Cal um, the, the Calcutta Congress concluded. Uh, you know, the, the, it's a famous speech where he said, you know, the moderates of today are the, well, the radicals of yesterday and the moderates of, you know, uh, sorry, the radicals of today are the, are the moderates of tomorrow. And he was in many ways pointing to Naroji. I mean, Naroji was considered a radical uh, through the 1890s uh, amongst nationalists in general, but because things just stayed, changed at such a rapid clip, I think, uh, during the late uh, 1890s and early 1900s, that his politics became much more moderate in comparison. And, and certainly, you know, by the time Gandhi is on the stage, uh, most of his political tactics are being dismissed. I mean, there is a certain dwindling band of liberals who hold to that tactic, uh, as you know, uh, but they are very much on the sidelines. So I wanted to just, uh, you know, when I was going through your book, there are a lot of students here, Neve students particularly, and Naruji was a really cool dude, right, for two things you've already covered. One is he really changed his mind, which is really hard. The second one was just weaponizing data sets, you know, the Brit weapon using the British data set against them. I thought that was just amazing. But the third one, which you say is a radical phase, he just had this remarkable ability to build friends and alliances and partnerships. I mean, he was a member of the Church of England Burial, Funeral, and Mourning Association. He was the vice president of the London Goldsmiths Jewelers Annuity and Asylum Institution. He was an honorary member of the Independent of Mem Order of Ratchabites. I don't know what Ratchabites is. No you didn't have that either. But they're like, can you describe that part? I love the checks that he wrote. I, don't, I mean, yeah. he was writing these checks to all these. So he really built a big tent um, in that phase. So clearly he had this ability to build relationships, social capital, which he, which he did. So can you describe that ability yeah. and phase? Well, a large part of it is just because, I mean, in the era before television and internet and Twitter and whatever you want, I mean, people had much more time on their hands, right? I mean, they, they, weren't, you know, they weren't glued to a, a computer screen or a television screen all the time. But the, the civic culture in Great Britain in the Victorian era was extremely thick. I mean, people uh, were members of multiple organizations because of campaigns like the eight-hour, you know, uh, workday and such. People consciously wanted to have, say, four hours of their life where they could attend, you know, meetings of whoever the Reshavites were or the, you know, the, the English, you know, burial reform association, God knows what they were doing. So, you know, that's what you did. You joined lots of different associations. And if you wanted to get into politics, uh, you had to do that even more. 
Uh, so, you know, Narochi was a member of, you know, as you, I, I think you said, a, gold, a goldsmiths and watchmakers association. Why on earth is, an, is a Parsi man, you know, I mean, Parsis like gold and they like watches, yes. But, um, you know, why is a Parsi man from Bombay joining this organization? And the answer is actually quite simple because uh, the constituency he campaigned from, Central Finsbury, was the place where watches and clocks were made. So, I mean, if you actually look at old clocks here in India, sometimes you'll see Finsbury written uh, as, as the place where these clocks were made. Uh, so it was it was very tactical. Um, the one thing I enjoyed you know, the most, I was, I was telling Ram earlier today, I don't understand a single thing of cricket. It's my great failing being in India that, you know, I still don't understand anything about it. But Narochi was very interested in cricket. Uh, he was a member of cricket associations that involved Britons, as well as Indians living in Britain, as well as Indians in India. So when, you know, cricket teams came to London from India, as Prashant Kidambi has written about in his book, uh, they contacted Narochi. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the letters are there in the National Archives. Unfortunately, they're so decayed, I can't read them. Uh, but, you know, there are all these fascinating angles to his life. Um, and then many other associations that he was a member of that, you know, uh, speak to, again, this, this, this wider Victorian culture of, of uh, civic associations, especially Freeman's masonry. Uh, you know, Masonic organizations were big in India um, in the nationalist era. I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, nationalists, especially Pisces, for some, for some reason, were really into Masonic organizations. And these Masonic organizations in India gave you an, a passport in many ways to uh, meet important leaders in Great Britain. You know, you'd say I'm a, the, you know, the, a member of, you know, this Masonic Lodge in, in Moscow and in Bombay. Well, now, you know, you're welcome to hear, you know, my Masonic Lodge in Southwark in, in London. Uh, so all of these things helped. Uh, you know, the one other thing that, you know, we haven't talked about is, you know, journalist associations, newspapers, uh, printing presses. You know, he was, he was involved in all of these things uh, in Bombay and uh, as well as in London as well. So he... I don't know where he had the time. I don't know if he just did not sleep. He was very strategic. Perhaps, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, if you think of your questions, with then... So yeah. then one last from me. Uh, uh, Dinarabh, you know, you mentioned in passing sort of uh, Naruji's demand for reparations. Hmm. And in recent years, this has become a live topic again in India. Absolutely. Uh, in, not just in India, across the world, in political theory circles, of course. Hmm. But in India, also in political circles, Shashi Tharoor most famously talked right. about reparations uh, not long ago. So I was wondering whether you'd like to tell us a little bit more about that. Hmm. Uh, that aspect. What exactly was it? Was it a rhetorical demand, or was there real content to it? Uh, and how and how was it perceived? So, Naroji's demand for reparations was Swaraj. He said, you know, after all these terrible things you've done to us, <laughs> uh, you must give us Swaraj. That was the, the reparation he had in mind. Whether he had more in mind, I wish I knew. I mean, oftentimes with a lot of these, you know, big ideas like reparations or what his views were about the future of Indian politics, he was remarkably vague. Uh, so with reparations also, I mean, he wrote a letter to Henry Campbell Bannerman, who was the prime minister in, in Britain after 1905, where he said, you know, you owe us reparations, but those repar and those reparations would be Swaraj. Whether or not he wanted also money, uh, uh, good question. I don't know. I mean, you know, his calculations on the drain of wealth were on the order of, Roughly 25% of revenues collected in India were taken out of India every year uh, and taken back to Great Britain. Scholars have debated about this in you know recent years. I mean, it's still a very hot button topic. I know Utsa Patnaik has written about how that figure might be close to 45 trillion. There are others on the other uh, you know on, on the other side of the political perspective who say no, there wasn't really that much of a drain, or it was relatively inf infinitesimal in comparison to what's been you know talked about in, in scholarship and such. Um, I don't know whether or not he wanted monetary things uh, to be given back. I, I wish I knew. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure if we had, t you know, tape recorders or audio recorders, our record would be much more, you know, I mean, again, the, one of the frustrating things about being a historian is that, you know, you know what is on paper is only a fraction of what was discussed in, uh, in reality. You know, I mean, Naroji probably had far more radical and far ranging conversations than he ever put, put down to paper. Thank you. So does anybody have questions? I have lots, so I can carry on. But if anybody has, Zareer, do you want to give Zareer the mic there? Is there, Ravi's not here, we can violate his rule if everybody has to walk up. <laughs> or is he here? <laughs> just give him the mic, Zareer. Ronak, you want to just give the mic to everybody after this? Zareer is right there. Thank you. Uh, Dinyar, my uh, question is, uh, during the course of your research, did you get a sense of what the, uh, nobility in the Parsi community at the time, his contemporaries, people like Jamseji, Chichipoy, uh, Jayan Tata, who were primarily industrialists and 
philanthropists, how did they view Nauruji? Did they see him as one of them? Or did they see him as some kind of a, of a radical who really didn't fit in with uh, what the Parsi community was all about at the time? Right. So as you That's the real Bartliwala. Ah, very good. <laughs> Kept no, okay. uh, as you will know, as well as I am, Parsis love to fight, right? I mean, so, you know, <laughs> there, there were people who thought Nauruji's politics were far too radical and against the community's interests. There were those who thought that, um, you know, his politics were, was, were correct and, you know, the, the drain of wealth was real. Um, then, as now, no Parsi could agree. They, everyone had three different opinions that they kept to themselves and, you know, the Tamasha happened consequently. So, so I mean, we, we do know that, I mean, people like Gigi Boy, for example. I mean, Gigi Boy passed away quite, quite early in Nauroji's life. Uh, he supported Nauroji's attempts to open girls' schools. Uh, we don't know much more. I mean, Nauroji was very much anti-opium. And considering that Gigi Boy was pro-opium <laughs> in, in, the, in the sense of, you know, marketing it, there probably was some conflict there. Um, as, in, as for JN Tata, um, again, this is one of those things which I really wish I knew more uh, because the archival record is, does not tell us much. Uh, you know, I, I have a friend, uh, Mircea Riano, who's come out recently with a book on, on the Tatas, and he talks a little bit about the relationship that Naroji and Gian Tata had, and I talked a little bit about it in my book, but unfortunately, very little actually survives. Uh, so, you know, Gian Tata, we, we think of as being this, this nationalist-minded businessman. Um, I could not find much evidence of Gian Tata's involvement with the Congress. Uh, Gian Tata's pa papers were burned, so there might be evidence, but unfortunately, that went up in a fire in the 1920s. Um, what I do know is that Nauroji did coax Jayan Tata to raise capital in India rather than London uh, for things like uh, the steel mills in Jamshedpur. Uh, he said, you know, you, you, know you, you, you can't, you know, create a different type of drain, right? I mean, bringing in capital from, from abroad, whatever the profits would go back abroad as well. You have to br bring Indian, you know, Swadeshi capital into the equation. Uh, so, you know, there were conversations that the two men have definitely had about, you know, capitalism in a, in a nationalist perspective. Um, unfortunately, we are not privy to those. Um, many other industrialists, like the Pidgets, for example, um, were far more cautious. I mean, the pit, the, uh, the Pittits um, were a good example of how many Parsi industrialists were, uh, you know, pro-nationalist up to a point. You know, they were they were up, they were nationalist, you know, in terms of wanting to help establish the Congress and campaign for political rights. But when people got a little too radical for their taste, they you know, quickly backtracked. Uh, so you know, Pittit, like Manchuji Bhavanagri, uh, who you know also had his hand in industry and commerce, uh, started out as being pro-Congress. Uh, but by the late 1880s, when they saw that people were talking about things like self-government and, you know, the viceroys were getting angry at the Congress, they quickly backtracked and said, no, we want nothing to do with this and we're anti-Congress. Uh, so it's, it's a mixed picture. Shrikar, um, he's, he's our 10th round of New India Fellows. He's writing a great book on activism in Karnataka, social activism. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And uh, so I haven't managed to read the book yet, and this might get answered in the course of that. but. Since you mentioned that he was a socialist, I was curious to know what exactly constituted his ideas of socialism. And secondly, what was his relationship with other British socialists of that time, say George Bernard Shaw, for instance? Shaw, sure, yeah. So I, I'll, I'll just answer that uh, uh, first of all. Um, so I, one other scholar, Shruti Rajakopalacharan, has actually pointed out a letter where Shaw talks about how uh, he, he was very happy that Naroji got elected and, you know, I mean, Shaw and, and Naroji were part of the same Fabian circle, uh, which of course included the webs as well. Um, I don't know much else. I mean, again, I know that Shaw and Naroji shared the same political stage, but unfortunately there's not much. Um, there's not much more than that. Uh, in terms of Naroji's socialist politics, I mean, when I, when I call him a socialist, I'm uh, basically, you know, talking about the fact that, you know, I mean, he saw certain systemic flaws in capitalism. Uh, he actually talked quite extensively about problems in capitalism. He was still pro-capitalist to a degree. I mean, he was socialist in a different way from, say, socialist today in the sense that, uh, you know, he supported things like free trade, but he wanted that free trade to be what he called real free trade, uh, where, you know, uh, and, and Radhani would talk about this stuff also, right? Where, you know, um, there's, there's a, a passage in a letter that Naroji wrote to Ramesh Chandra Dutt where he says, you know, free trade between Great Britain and um, the United Kingdom is like a, a very strong man, you know, um, bossing over a starving, you know, infamished individual. That was free trade. And free trade, in his mind, meant two people on equal standing who trade as equals and there'd be mutual benefit. That's what he wanted to see. Um, 
So socialism was part of the answer of, of being able to get to that point. Uh, how so? Uh, well, in Great Britain, it would, you know, the, 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 the element of, you know, um, you know, things like, you know, the eight-hour uh, eight hour workday and workers' rights and uh, support for unions would uh, ensure that workers' interests, as well as those of, you know, just, you know, just the, the capitalist class were taken into account. Um, things like, you know, the rights of women uh, were part of this kind of broader socialist equation. There are a lot of, a lot of women involved in, in socialist organizations or campaigning for, for socialist rights as well. Um, eventually, you know, Naroji was in favor of, uh, you know, things that were a bit more advanced, like, you know, workers' courts, which would be where workers could go and, you know, kind of get arbitration uh, with, you know, industrialists taken care of in special courts. Um, he was in favor of, you know, greater alms and, you know, what we now today call welfare benefits being given to people in Britain. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he also had some stuff to say about fa factory legislation that was being put, ab put about in India also at this time. Unfortunately, a lot of that material is not there anymore. Um, so he was in very, in, in many ways, uh, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century socialist. Um, the one, you know, I mean, this universe was, again, very different from the socialism that we think of today. I mean, it was um, far more circumscribed in terms of the advancement of its political ideologies. It was also very anti-Semitic. Uh, so, you know, one thing that surprised me, at least, is reading letters from, say, Hinman or uh, others, you know, American socialists, for example, uh, just how virulent the, the sentiment was against Jews. Um, now, Roji did not seem to take part of that. Good for him. Um, and, you know, I mean, he was someone who, again, seemed to be quite anti-racist. I mean, not fully anti-racist, but for his time, extremely anti-racist. So, you know, when there were people criticizing, say, Chinese workers coming into, say, South Africa or even Great Britain, he'd, he'd go against that. I mean, he'd say, you know, you can't really do that. Um, you know, he was uh, someone who, who definitely supported, um, you know, the rights of African-Americans, um, as well as, uh, you know, Africans living in the, the West Indies. He said far less about Africans themselves. Uh, you know, I mean, he did make one or two references to Hottentots, which was, you know, kind of a, a phrase used to describe a supposedly uncivilized African, uh, which again, all other Indians did, right? Gandhi did, Srinivasa Sastri did, you know, everyone kind of said, you know, we Indians, we are not Hottentots. By their standards, by their standards, that, that was not uncommon. By our standards, that's a little bit racist. So, I mean, we do have to adopt, we can't adopt, you know, we, we can't be so woke when we look at uh, figures like him. We have to realize the times that they operated in. So, Narayan, then Prem, you, you want to ask something? I, no, I just wanted to add to what uh, Dinya just said about, you asked about Shaw. Shaw and many of the Fabians were very much against the Chinese. Yeah. And they used to speak about the yellow peril. So, you know, British socialism of that time was pretty racist and anti-Semitic. Yeah, there's actually a book called Funny, I Didn't Think You Were Racist, which is on socialists who <laughs> were bizarrely racist in, 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 in many ways. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Two-part two question. Yes. Uh, part one is back to the Parsis. Uh, what was his relationship with other Parsi politicians like Firoz Mehta, for instance? Mm -hmm. And also among the Indian pantheon of his time in politics, who was he closest to or most distant from, but in a much more tangible way than just being in Finsbury. Right, right. So um, in terms of the other Parsi politicians, like say Firoz Mehta or Dinsha Vacha, very close. Uh, he was especially close to Dinsha Vacha. Uh, they wrote quite often to one another. Firoz Mehta less so. I mean, um, all of these, you know, these these individuals, people like uh, Firoz Mehta, Dutt, um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, other people who are kind of in the political firmament of the time, Many of them went to Great Britain in the 1870s and they established relationships with Naroji because Naroji was already there. And then they moved back to India and they kept up a relationship. Uh, so, you know, there is some stuff to be said about, say, like his relationship with people like Mehta, but unfortunately, a lot of the letters are not there. There are many more letters between Naroji and someone like Dinsha Vacha. The problem with Dinsha Vacha's letters is that they are written in terrible handwriting. I mean, literally, I have spent <laughs> hours looking at Dicha Vata's handwriting and saying, what the hell is this man saying? Uh, and many scholars have done that before me. When S.R. Merothra and I used to talk about, you know, terrible handwriting of his and uh, Malbari and, and many others. Um, and you, these correspondents would actually talk about how that each person's handwriting was terrible. They didn't, you know, Naroji would write to Vacha and say, write more clearly. I can't understand what you're saying. Uh, so <laughs> there's a lot more that needs to be, you know, deciphered, if you will about that relationship. So Naroji was definitely close to Vacha. Naroji was also close to uh, Behramji Malbari. 
Now, Malbari is someone who we think of as being more of a social reformer. He was involved in this Age, for, uh, age of Consent Act that was passed in the early 1890s that raised the age of uh, consent for, for girls to, I, I think, age 11 or 12, which at that time was <laughs> progressive, remarkably. Um, now, Malbari was also very involved in, in politics. I mean, he was briefly a member of the Congress, and he was closely involved in a lot of Nairobi's campaigns. Uh, and, you know, even though Malbari was much younger to Nairobi, the two were kind of, you know, they, almost, they were almost like brothers in many senses. You know, the families kind of looked after one another. Uh, so that relationship was very close. Um, there were many others. I mean, you know, people who were, you know, prominent in politics uh, who we do not know of today. I mean, people like Adishya Wadia, who was in many ways uh, one of Nairobi's protégés. Unfortunately for this man, Adishya Wadia, uh, nationalist politics went in such a radical direction from what it had been in the 1890s that people like Wadia were lost, you know, in, in the background. Uh, people like Vacha, Wadia, many other of these Parsi moderates uh, were pushed to the margins by the, the 19-teens and 1920s, which is why we don't know more, more about them. The second part of your question was with regard to nationalism in general, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, he was definitely close to Ranade. I mean, so the two obviously had much to talk about in terms of economics. Again, the problem here is that a lot of Ranade's papers have been lost. I mean, if you look at Ranade's papers in the National Archives, they're about Yetil, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, Gokhale was someone who, in many ways, was uh, maybe not, you know, Naruji wasn't necessarily a mentor, but someone who was, you know, who took kind of like a fatherly interest in Gokhale's career. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot of correspondence, and, and especially towards the end of Naroji's political life, you could see Naroji trying to push Gokhale in, in, in a more radical direction. Gokhale was very hesitant about making a demand for self-government. Um, and Naroji literally put the word self-government in, in, in Gokhale's mouth. Uh, how did he do that? Well, you know, the, in the 1906 Calcutta Congress, where Naroji was the president, uh, Naroji would, you know, he was, he was supposed to give the speech, right? I mean, every president was supposed to give a speech. And of course, this was an era where there were no microphones or whatever. So, you know, you had to just speak loudly. Now, an 81-year-old man could not speak loudly. So what did he do? He gave the speech to Gokhale. And in that speech, Gokhale said, Baya Naroji, we support Swaraj. So, you know, in, in, in many creative ways, Gokhale was encouraged by Naroji and others to, uh, you know, to be a bit more radical. Um, other politicians, uh, you know, some of you may have heard of people like W.C. Bonerji, who was the, the first president of the Indian National Congress, uh, someone who was very Anglophile, even more Anglophile than many Parsis, which is hard to believe. Uh, you know, this, this was a man who lived in London for the, the last half of his life. He lived in a, a mansion in, in, in Croydon that he called Kidapur. Uh, he loved to claim that he had not an Indian, you know, an article of Indian clothing in his, uh, in his house, and yet he remained quite nationalist in many of his political leadings. Uh, Bonerji was also quite moderate. So towards the end of Nauroji's life, him and Bonerji were going in two separate ways. Um, there were other people. I mean, Shamji Krishnavarma is an interesting example. Uh, Shamji Krishnavarma was someone who uh, was involved in a lot of princely state politics uh, in the 1880s and 1870s in places like Kutch and I think also in Gondal. Um, and, uh, you know, through a friendship with Herbert Spencer uh, and through his own radicalization, uh, becomes far more radical by the early 1900s to the point where he becomes Nairobi's biggest critic uh, by, say, 1904, 1905. So, you know, he wrote uh, a newspaper called the, he edited a newspaper called The Indian Sociologist. Um, and pretty much every edition of the Indian Sociologist up until 1907 has an article fiercely condemning Nauroji. Uh, so relationships changed. I mean, this was a relationship based on friendship through around maybe 1901, 1902, uh, and then it diverged. Uh, so, you know, even those particular friendships did not hold course uh, through the course of his career. So we have almost running out of time. So one question there, there. Uh, I'll come to the, these two and then... And then okay. Yes, you. Yeah, ma'am, after you. You go. Yes, sure. So two quick questions. And uh, to, to begin with an observation, you know, we uh, in an act of provincializing Bengal, I think this is a very, very good start. Because there needs to be a lot written about the, what my, one might call the Deccan Renaissance, right? Like if you, the figures that you've named both political, but also political thinkers, right? Like, um, and how all of that comes together uh, is a picture that still, need, still needs to be written. But I have two specific questions. One of them is, I still like to think that uh, the kind of work uh, that is subsumed under statistical liberalism mm -hmm. um, uh, of the time, as Bailey characterized it, was an attempt at the uh, was a first attempt in many ways at national income accounting, which some which is something mm -hmm. that doesn't come into play up up until the 1920s. And I was wondering if you found any links to you know because the, a lot of this work also happened in London, and Colin Clark eventually became sort of you know the 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 node of it. 
if there were there are any traceable connections um, to uh, Colin Clark and others in Cambridge where this feeds into their thinking of national income accounting. So that's the first. And the second is his relation, uh, Nauraji's relationship to Hindman. Because mm. if I'm not mistaken, and correct me here, uh, if I'm wrong, um, they became friends in about the 1870s. That's right? correct, yeah. And the radical phase for Nauraji comes much later, whereas Hindman, of course, you know, is, is uh, not only is he sort of dealing with numbers in a very, very uh, intense manner in the 1870s already, mm -hmm. the radicalism in Nauraji's life is much later. So what kind of a relationship did they share before uh, you know, Norwich went radical. Yeah. Um, so with regard to your first question, with Clark, I, I don't know. I mean, that, that's a name that, that did not come up in my research. Um, one very frustrating aspect, again, of this project was understanding how Naroji's ideas were broadcast amongst, um, you know, thinkers, you know, thinkers in terms of, you know, people talking about poverty or empire and such. Um, I could find very few links. I mean, you know, someone like, you know, J.A. Hobson, you know, who has this, you know, critique on imperialism that's published the very same year as Naroji's, um, or I think the year before, uh, uh, Naroji's, uh, you know, famous work, Poverty and Un-British Rule, they didn't seem to know one another or they didn't communicate with one another, which is enormously frustrating because they were thinking in many ways, many of the same things. And yet, you know, and then the same city, what's going on? I mean, maybe they did have uh, conversations with, with one another, but they weren't recorded. Um, so I don't know, um, you know, since Naroji was part of the, again, that universe that led to the creation of things like LSC, um, I'm sure he had conversations with people who were thinking about sociology and thinking about things like income and, uh, you know, what he talked about. I mean, what, what Janavi was talking about was uh, in terms of, you know, calculating national income. This is what you know, Naroji was recognized as being the first person to really calculate uh, national income in, uh, for India. I mean, it, it was a pretty simple process. I mean, he basically took uh, the total revenues um, that were collected in, in India, um, took that as a percentage of the national economy because the taxation was uh, by a certain, you know, of a certain rate, of a certain percentage, divided by the population, and you get something like, you know, I think it was, uh, what, uh, around two pounds um, per year that an Indian uh, could live on, which, uh, you know, sounds terrible today, and it wasn't as bad back then, but it was pretty bad. I mean, in comparison, I think the average income in Great Britain was around 30, 35 pounds or something. So you can say that Great Britain is about 15, you know, 15, 16 times more wealthy than India. Um, and, you know, this was a devastating statistic that showed that, you know, Indians were not just very poor, but, you know, you could not do much with two, two pounds, right? I mean, Naroji actually showed through statistics that um, it cost more than two pounds to keep a prisoner alive in a prison in India, or it cost more than two pounds to keep a, a coolie immigrant, you know, these uh, immigrants who are going, emigrants who are going from, say, Bihar or northern India to South Africa or Malaya, uh, to keep them alive on a boat when they are stationary. Okay, so what could an Indian do with two uh, with two pounds? And that you know, for, for Naroji, that was the explanation why so many people died from famines because they just didn't have money, right? Um, now, your second question was with regard to Hinman. Uh, Hinman, um, you know, I'd love to write something on Hinman. He was, I think, you know, the, the, perhaps the most interesting person I encountered in the book, aside from the main character. Um, for those of you who don't know much about Hinman, uh, Henry Hinman was, uh, you know, regarded as the first real British socialist political leader. He, he founded uh, the first socialist political party. He was a fascinating guy. He came from a conservative family which had uh, dealings in the West Indies. He started out at a, as a conservative. Then he went to, I think, California or somewhere, somewhere in the West Coast and prospected for gold. On the way, he, he read Marx. He got converted to Marxism, went back to Great Britain, talked about socialism, um, learned about uh, you know, the drain of wealth through Naroji's writing, met Naroji in the 1870s, uh, and the two struck up a friendship that lasted for the rest of, of their life. Um, Hinman became dramatically radical by the 1890s, uh, to the point where he is open. You know, he openly calls for Indians to rebel. I, I mean, you know, if you read his writings, he's basically, you know, his private writings, not his public writings. But if you read his letters, he's saying, you know, the only choice Indians have at this point, so the 1890s, uh, is to take up arms and rebel. And, you know, we should support that. Uh, now, Ruti is not in that camp. Okay, so, so this is where the two men start to see uh, things a little bit differently. Um, and Hinman was one of those people like Shamji Krishnabarma who becomes very critical of Naroji uh, in the last phase of, of his political life and says, you need to become more radical. You need to take a much more uh, firm line against uh, against British rule. And you know, Hinman is a Briton, right? I mean, Hinman himself is saying, you know, you know, my fellow Britons, we come from pirate stock. <laughs> you know, what can you expect of us? We're not honorable people. Um, you know, you need, you as uh, Indians need to fight for what's due for you. Um, Hinman never ever visited Indian once, uh, and yet he was probably, until you know, at least World War One, you know, one of the greatest advocates for 
some measure of not Indian independence, but you know, self-rule and uh, dissolving the ties between Great Britain and uh, and uh, and India. I mean, not not fully, but you know, going to great lengths. Uh, their relationship is fantastic. I mean, you can you can you can feel Hindman's presence leaping at you off the page. I mean, this is this was a man who I mean, he had a you know, he was a big portly man. He had a red beard. He would yell and scream at people. He made you know enemies out of friends, left, right, and centers. <laughs> you know, as as uh, you know, many people who've studied him know. Um, you know, he's one of those people who figure in Indian history, but you know, and deserve to have more attention sh you know, sh shined on, on on his particular political career and how he inspired in many ways uh, a new generation of, of of Indians. Everyone from Savarka down to you know, I mean, even people. I, I think people like Gandhi and others were were talking, at least talking about some of the ideas that uh, you know Hindman was discussing. Yes, ma'am. We're running out uh -huh. of time. So yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Danya. Priyanka here. Uh, thank you. Fascinating listening to you. Apologies, I haven't read the book as yet. Um, I've been Professor Jayal's student, and I myself teach here in Bengaluru today. I have a very simple question to you. If you had to cull out one or two key ideas of nationalism from Nauroji's treatise, what would they be to talk to the youth today, given the overarching construct of nationalism that is hanging on our heads in India that we end in 2021? Um, you know, I mean, I mean, I've, I've I've said this in I think one or two interviews also since this book prize was announced. I mean, the the type of nationalism that was articulated by Nauruji and his generation it's not just Nauruji, right? I mean, it's that whole universe that's that's operating in, the, in this in this frame um, was liberal uh, in the sense that it was very inclusive. Um, you know, it was you know, I mean, it it did, it did not necessarily articulate a division between religion and, and uh, politics to the same degree as someone like Nehru would eventually, uh, but it saw nationalism as an open tent, um, not just for people of all different backgrounds in India, but really from across the world. I mean, if you look at the proceedings of the early Congress, uh, it's not just Indians who are there. There are Americans, there are Britons, there are you know, Irishmen who are coming as presidents, right? It's, it's a very open tent. Um, that seems to have been lost, right? I mean, in all the discussion that we've had recently about several lions and how great Indian civilization is and such, and the nationalism of today, um, you know, it, it wasn't a muscular nationalism, right? It was, it was a very open-minded kind of um, nationalism that saw maybe not solidarity. I mean, that was something that a later generation of, of Indian revolutionaries would articulate, but sympathy uh, with other people around the world who were also disadvantaged, disadvantaged, whether they were women who were denied the vote, whether they were Irishmen and Irish women, or Indians in South Africa, or African Americans and such. So, so it was, again, very outward looking, very open, very liberal. Um, the other thing, you know, I mean, there, there are many things. I, you know, I, 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 I won't bore you with anything but beyond two. But the other thing I, th I think that, you know, you can really gain from study of early nationalism is the importance of education. I mean, clearly, you know, after independence, the plot went off the path, right, in terms of, you know, educate the importance of education, at least primary and secondary education. This was something that early nationalists really valued. Uh, you know, Gokhale, of course, introduced a, a bill for universal education in, in the early 19. Uh, 1910s. Nauruji talked about universal education uh, as being necessary for India's upliftment as early as the 1880s uh, and state-supported education. Um, it is very significant that all of these early nationalists were themselves, I'm not all of them, but many of them, were themselves educationists, right? People who had, um, you know, involvement not just in colleges but also in girls' schools or uh, you know, educational societies uh, around India, uh, because, you know, they, they, they grew out of a, sc a schoolhouse environment, right? And um, they knew that, you know, in order for uh, India to grow uh, economically, you needed to have educated citizens. I mean, you know, poverty and lack of education were the two things holding back India. Um, we still do not seem to have fully got the plot on that, right? I mean, it, obviously things have improved dramatically, but, you know, if you we're still in an era where we have public schools where teachers are not showing up. I mean, my God, I mean, um, nationalists from 150 years ago were pointing out these flaws. Um, you know, that, I, I, you know, I, th I think if you want to fulfill some of the promise of early, early nationalism in the best way possible, uh, it's improve, it, you know, the best method of doing that is improving quality of education, whether it's building more universities, improving the overall standards of, of schools in India, um, uh, you know, increasing accountability, uh, you know, making the average Indian uh, reach his or her potential through education. That's, I mean, that ultimately was, um, you know, 
the thing that Nairobi articulated hand in hand with the drain of wealth. I mean, the drain of wealth was not just about money, it was also about human capital uh, that was being lost due to lack of opportunities. And one of those opportunities was education. Prem, and then maybe we combine the question with Roy. <clears throat> well, actually, I, my question overlaps a great deal with what you answered just now. But uh, looking at the fact that Nauroji is elected to the British Parliament in 1892, hmm. and he hasn't left Indian politics behind, because twice after that, he's elected president of the Indian National Congress, 1893 and 1906. And, uh, and you talked about the number of uh, foreigners involved with the early uh, Indian National Congress. And one can't imagine that happening today. So was politics different than having a sort of conceptual idealism to it, which allowed those things to happen? And has it today turned more instrumental in nature? So it's just seen as an internal affair to be uh, you know, restricted to unquestionably naturalized citizens. Mm -hmm. Rohini, just combine the questions and we're out of time. So these are the last two. I'm really sorry. As good academics, we must be out of time. <laughs> yes. Uh, first, thank you for the book. Fantastic. Uh, I'm thank a you. fellow Elphinstonian to the other by now. Oh, okay. so. uh, but very quickly, I'm still confused. I read your book. But uh, exactly when does he give up the idea? Does he give up the idea of British paramounts? Param mm -hmm. is, is, or is it, is it actually denigrated? Is it put off the charts? Or is it still self-government under British paramounts? Mm -hmm. I'm not clear when that happened. 1906, okay. But can you explain that a bit? Sure, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll just, sorry. Did, no, maybe since he's, yeah, I do slightly different question. Sure. Uh, you know, there's an incident in this where uh, he lobbies on behalf of the ruler of Gondal state to increase the number of gun salutes or whatever. Yes. And then he gets a check for that. Mm -hmm. So this would be, I mean, in today's world, it would be lobbying and election funding and all that. So he's a very pragmatic guy. So maybe you can comment on that. So let me go in reverse order. Uh, yes, in, in many ways, these early nationalists were, to a certain degree, lobbyists. Uh, in, in, the, in the sense that, you know, they knew that, you know, in, in order to start a political organization or run for parliament in Great Britain, the one thing you needed more than anything else was money. Money was in short supply in India, but who had money? The princes. What did the princes want? The princes wanted certain privileges, like, say, raising the number of gun salutes. I mean, again, this is the British Raj, right? So, I mean, you know, instead of Twitter or whatever, you, you know, you wanted to show your status and stuff through, you know, the number of guns that were fired, you know, when you arrived at state court or something like that. Uh, so, Naroji and other nationalists would lobby British authorities to extend certain privileges uh, towards um, certain nationalist-minded or, you know, at least inwardly nationalist-supportive um, Politicians like Saji Rao, uh, oh, sorry, uh, princely rulers like Saji Rao or Bhagwat Sinji and all. Uh, so there was a, a degree of mutual mutual reciprocity built in the relationship between um, princely rulers and these early nationalists. Uh, both got what they wanted from the equation. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's quite clear that a lot of Naroji's campaign funding uh, for his campaigns in Great Britain came from um, you know states like Gondor or Baroda uh, or places like Bhavnagar. Uh, now, in regards to, sorry, remind me. Short when, did he, when did he go? Right, right, right. When did he actually become it or renounce it? Right. So, in the early 20th century, Nairoji started to talk about something called self government under British paramountcy. What that meant was something like what, um, you know, say an Australia or Canada is today, in the sense that, you know, Australia and Canada are self governing um, entities, but uh, unlike Barbados now, um, they, you know, nominally paid heed to the fact that they were in the British Empire because the, the head of state was, you know, Victoria or today, you know, would be Elizabeth. Uh, so Naroji kept this demand, you know, from roughly, say, the year 1901, 1902 till about 1905. Um, and again, a lot of people criticized him for that. I mean, you know, what, people like Hinman, for example, said, why would you want to do this? You just need self-government. His last political speech that he gives in 1906, the Calcutta Congress, uh, he makes a definitive break. So really that, that, that break is... You know, it's sometime in 1906. I can't tell you precisely when, but it definitely is by the time of the Congress in, in late um, December 1906. Um, and at that point, he says, you know, self-government under British paramountcy or self-government like, you know, you know, Great Britain. And Great Britain, of course, is a autonom fully autonomous country, right? So therefore, he's suggesting something like Great Britain for India as well, um, which is a pretty radical break, uh, you know, considering that you know, Purn Swaraj does not come until 1929, right, as a demand within the Congress. And here's Naroji in 1906 saying that publicly, which is, I mean, people were saying it in private all, all the time, but to say that publicly before, uh, you know, a group of Indian leaders is quite another thing. Yeah. 
and remind me, sorry, once more about your question. Oh, so, sorry. Yes. Right, 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 right. Um, I hope this is a relatively brief phrase that, that we're in, where, you know, things are a bit more inward looking. I mean, because one can chart this more capacious idea of, what an, of who an Indian is uh, until relatively recently, right? I mean, you know, so some of you know, um, you know, through the 50s and 60s, India would attract scientific and academic talent from around the world. Uh, it still does, right? I mean, there still are people who come from, uh, you know, different parts of the world. Uh, someone like J.B.S. Haldane, the famous biologist, uh, became an Indian citizen, right? He regarded himself as, as an Indian in the, in the 50s and the, and the, and the 60s. Um, you, know, you dress in kurtas, all that. And, you know, you, it, 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 it was, it, it, it really wasn't questioned, right? And, um, you know, and these, and, you know, that was the atmosphere you had in early nationalism as well. People like Alan Octavian Hume, the founder of the Congress, called himself a native. And what he meant by that was a native in, of India. Uh, he regarded himself as an Indian. Um, and there were many others uh, who, you know, regarded themselves that way. So the idea of who was an Indian uh, was very fluid. Uh, and I do think there still is that um, strain in Indian culture, uh, an openness. I mean, historically, that's that's been apparent. But there's also been the other strain, right, which is much more inward looking and exclusionary. And we, of course, know which strain is, is in dominance right now. One can be cautiously hopeful that hopefully things will reverse, and, and hopefully soon. I mean, we are really out of time. My apologies. I, we can go on with this. I think, you know, it's just a remarkable book for giving you a sense of how Naroji was responsible for the team of rivals which eventually got us independence and the rival ideas which eventually got us independence. Gandhiji called Naroji the father of the nation. But my favorite line in the book is, Naroji was too moderate for the radicals and too radical for the moderates. It just, those are words to live by. Thank you so much for making the trip from Bombay to be with thank us. You. Thank you for writing the book and thank you all for listening patiently. <laughs>